Imagine 2016. Yangon, Myanmar. Chinatown, 42nd Street. And an eight-year-old version of me. Wait, I think that might be a little bit too hard for you to imagine. Let me give you a picture of eight-year-old me. So, imagine this little boy walking down the streets of Chinatown, where I see a pho restaurant. And being that curious little eight-year-old boy, I, of course, had to go try it. Let me tell you, it was the best pho I've ever had in my life. The broth, an absolute symphony of flavors flowing down your tongue. The noodles, a perfect texture. And the star of the show, beef. It was so tender and juicy, it melts right in your mouth. It was so good, I had three entire bowls down my belly. <laughs> Three entire bowls. And I went to sleep that night, knowing that, oh, I found a new favorite restaurant. And I was really happy. Until I wasn't. Tomorrow's headlines accused the establishment of serving human flesh instead of beef. Wait, I am not admitting that I ate human flesh. No, no. It was just accused. I am. In fact, I am not sure myself, so I turned to my parents, where I sought out for answers, and I got met with this. Uncomfortable silence. So I had to take matters into my own hands. Good afternoon, my potential dinners. My name is Pyo, and today I'll take you onto a journey of human cannibalism. So let's start. To begin, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. Human cannibalism, what does it mean? It is the act of consuming another human's flesh or organs. So, for example, if I were to bite my fingernails, that is not cannibalism. But if I were to chop my finger and consumed it, that would be considered as cannibalism. So I ingested my finger. But wait, what if my younger sibling bit me when I was like eight? Is that cannibalism? No, it's not. Hopefully not, because they most likely did not ingest your flesh. OK, so let us start at the very beginning, literally the start of mankind, 300,000 years ago where we see Homo sapiens and Neanderthals engaging in cannibalism through archaeological evidence, where we like to think that they did this for survival. Next, moving on, we have ancient Egypt, where they engaged in cannibalism as a last resort for survival during war and famine, where their only source of food was other humans in the vast desert. And lastly, the island Korea people, who we think that they did this because of a culture. We don't know much about them, though they still exist to this day. But we find the most fascinating evidence in the Paleolithic era in Gov's Cave, England, where we meet the Magdalenian people, who consumed each other as a tradition, as a part of their culture, they embraced this taboo. Cannibalism was a part of their culture. Let me get back to that later, because moving beyond Europe and history, we see the Amazon Basin. Research companies like the Max Planck Institute explore the indigenous tribes located along the riverbank, where some of which practice cannibalism for the same reasons that the Magdalenians people did. It was a part of their tradition, culture. They embraced it. And we, modern humans, treated it like a problem. And since it's a problem, there's always a solution. So guess what we came up with? Hufu. In 2005, a company introduced human tofu. It was a healthy human flesh alternative 
Essentially, you were able to eat human and enjoy all the benefits of consuming human flesh without actually consuming humans. But that wasn't the case at all. Disappointing. Real disappointing. Because we even went a step further. We even made it taste like human. But it wasn't even as healthy as normal tofu, nor did it taste like actual human. How do I know this? Well, I don't, but this guy does. Armin Muse, a German cannibal who consumed an estimate of 20 kilograms, a whole 20 kilograms of his victim. That's 42 pounds for you Americans. And he described the taste of human flesh to someone like pork, but a little bit more bitter and stronger. There are also people like William Bueller Seabrook, who is a journalist traveling all the way to West Africa for what you might ask, not to study the tribes that engaged in cannibalism, but to partake in it himself. And he described the taste the same way Armin did. Pork, a little bit bigger and stronger. But all of them had one thing in common, except for the hufu consumers. They all suffered consequences. They faced consequences. Of course, it is a taboo. Other than legal consequences, the health consequences of consuming human flesh are non-existent. Absolutely zero. You are safe to eat. FDA approved. You are edible. You can be consumed the same way you can consume a chicken. Like, ever heard of chicken sejuan? You can make human sejuan the same way, and nothing would change. However, there is one thing that I left out, which is an organ of the human body. It is the brain. And what's really interesting is that when you consume the brain, it affects your brain. Uh, to put it simply, when your brain detects that it ate another brain, it doesn't know what to do. It really doesn't know what to feel about it because it just ate another one of its kind. So it suffers a transmissible spongiform disease, which is known as Kuru. Explored by neurovirologists, we can know the symptoms, which is severe coordination problems, swallowing difficulty, tremors, and muscle jerk. And speaking about the brain, the same brain that we have is capable of cognitive thinking. So we come up with reasons to answer the question, why? Why cannibalism? Why? And we turn to ethical and philosophical considerations. Ethicists such as William, well, no, not William, I meant Peter Singer, an ethicist, who explored the formation of these cultural taboos and how we, as the real world, view their culture as a taboo. But maybe it's not that deep. Maybe we don't need to look that far. Maybe we can just look at our neighbors that share our home that we call Earth. Yes, I'm talking about animals. Yes, animals. In our first picture, we see chickens eating a fried chicken, where they are completely unaware that they're consuming another fried chicken. You know, I like to think of myself as a chicken. Wait, no, I was not the chicken that was cooked. To make it very clear, I was the chicken eating the fried chicken. But unlike those chickens, I had no confirmation or evidence that I consumed another human. None. Anyways, beside that picture, we find a spider eating another spider right after mating, a female consuming a male. And this is done because of a genetic benefit. It is hardwired into their biology, where after they're done mating, the female will consume the male. This is explored by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, where he describes how this genetic benefit 
or drive such seemingly barbaric behaviors. Speaking of barbarity, we finally reach present day, or close to present day, 2023. In Miami, a zombie emerged, where the guy on the bottom left of my slide bit off a homeless man's face. First of all, why a homeless man? But secondly, he, of course, was charged. And people like Willie, oh, no, not William, no. People like Robert D. Hare look into the criminal psychology aspect of cannibalism, where he reasoned that he just did this just because. Same thing as why do people climb mountains? Because they simply exist. Why does he eat humans? Because they exist. Well, to put it simply, he is quite cuckoo in the head. And beside him, we have Mao Sugiyama, who is a Japanese chef who cut off his own body parts and served it to his customers. $250 a plate. I got my pho for 2,500 chats at the time. What a scam. But anyways, he was charged for, well, serving human flesh without his victims knowing that it was human flesh. And finally, we have the North Korean famine of 1993 in North Korea, where people had to resort to cannibalism the same way people did 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt in times of desperation and survival. They did this because they had to. And me, I don't even know if I ate human meat. But it did spark this entire journey. And that will be the end of our journey, where now we can reflect on why this journey even matters. Cannibalism, a topic that is shrouded in silence, people refuse to talk about it, just like my parents, is not just a relic of the past, it is a bridge that connects the animal kingdom to human history. I invite all of you to view this topic with compassion and empathy, where we foster a deeper understanding of our humanities, where every one of us will be safeguarded and protected. Our intrinsic worth will be valued. So, this is not about my culinary preferences, no. You're not on the menu, but instead, it's an invitation to all of you to view humanity in all its complexity and how we deal with such dire circumstances, even cannibalism. Thank you. <laughs>